Good morning, everybody. It's Sunday. Hi, I'm Charlie. This is Charlie. <laughs> Welcome to this week's sexy tips and tricks and tactics uh, live feed. We're gonna go over a lot of shit today. That's, so sexy. <laughs> that's Morrison, the dog. Yeah. With the Dodgers hat, we got him last night at the uh, Paul McCartney. <laughs> For <laughs> this is Allie. Uh, I'm Allie. That's right. That's right. She runs uh, Pilates Punks, in case y'all want to check that out. You've seen some of the things. Hence the A. That's mine. It's for my mug. <laughs> that's right. I did. All right. Well, this week, uh, we're going to really cover into a lot of things. First up, I want to say welcome to everybody. We got over 100 new people this week, which is amazing. Um, we're really blowing up. A lot of folks coming in from the person line from Gary V Group. So welcome to y'all. Nice to see you. Let's see. We also want to go over um, the new ebook will be out this week. Sorry, uh, last week I had like three shows and I couldn't get it done. But it's all taken care of. It's up in the Slack. I've gotten some great feedback. So that's been super helpful. Um, I want to thank Raba and Ali and v that's me <laughs> and Vika. for all their help with the proofreading. Um, we're going to cover our Instagram growth tool and the alternatives because um, that went down this week. We're going to cover bucket-based CBO and all the sexy tips and tricks from this week. So sexy! She's my hype man today. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get you a big clock. Yes. Okay. Anyway, so with all that being said, let's get started off with um, I want to also say that Thank you, everybody that invited some folks. If this group is really important to you or if it makes sense to you or if you really value it, it would mean the world to me if you invited one person this week. Just one. That would be awesome. Also, uh, I want to thank... I invited Morrison. Morrison's already been on the group. They know about his dog food and everything. We use that as an example all the time. Wow, this is a bootleg shirt. You can tell because I, I have to do this to make it straight. Oh, well, that's great. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna cover all that. Uh, I want to say I want to thank everybody that's coming in, and um, also just let you guys know we have a Patreon which is linked in the group, and also your welcome message had the Patreon link in it. In there is all the eBooks and decks from other from other things that we can share. Outside of that, there's also a premium Slack which has a shit ton of stuff we can't even talk about in here. Screenshots of people's ad accounts. Uh, you know, uh, case studies, all sorts of other things that everybody's bringing in from all of their resources. Plus, it's basically just a super group of the most pop, most active users in this group uh, that are really getting together. We've got Shopify store pros like Court. We've got Amazon pros like Nick. We've got lead gen pros like Robin. We just got a brand new person in uh, last night from Australia. I'm super excited to have her in there. It's a, uh, she's dealing with being overwhelmed by like a dozen pages or a dozen rooms of hundreds of pieces of content. So um, it's super awesome. And there's also one-on-ones -on where you can chat with me uh, where we do one hour or three hour batches and you can do all of that stuff. And if you want to save 50% on any of it, do your homework from any of the weeks, which you can find by going to the announcement section on this group uh, or going to see any of the live feeds. All the live feeds have homework assigned to them. If you do any of the homework from any of the live feeds, you get 50% off any of the stuff above, or you just get a free ebook sent to you. Your choice. Let me know what you want. Okay. Outside of that, I uh, just want to say thank you guys a lot one more time. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> this group has um, really started to, to grow quickly, and, and it's been awesome. Um, I'm sure there's people commenting over here, but Facebook has not caught up with us yet. Uh, whatever. We'll see what happens. So last week we covered like the four major moves that it took to take a five-figure ad account from like a 1415 up to a 2X. And before that, we've been talking about the brand builder stuff, the six steps to building brands before you even do any prospecting spend on Facebook. That included things like tap joy and one click lander pages and, and branded search and how to probably do Facebook retargeting, uh, stacking your tiers of audiences. Um, we, we got into a lot of that stuff. Uh, so we're not, today we're going to kind of go back to some basics, which is some of the reasons that a lot of you came in here, which is the bucket based CBO. But before we do that, I do want to make an announcement about the Instagram growth tools. So it does look like our preferred tool, Instalex, is back up. 
However, I've been trying for the last few days and can vouch for it with a past experience, InstaZood, which a lot of you guys were asking about. Both of those are work. InstaZood's actually a little bit cheaper. I've just been using InstaLex for like four years, but it's a little off and on. The InstaZood people are responding back into uh, customer care's notification uh, requests and are getting multiple accounts. I've got things going actually on both, and um, all it's doing is doubling my traffic. So. Um, that's working and it's been really, really nice. So anyway, with that all being said, let's get into uh, the first part this week, which is the homework for this week, uh, where if you do that, you get anything that you want. Like I said, 50% off or free ebook sent your way. And this one's going to be, what's that? Yeah, free ebook. Free book. A, it's, it's a free book. Yeah, absolutely. So this is one is really simple. But I see a lot of people not utilizing it nearly enough. So we're getting back to basics here. This is something we covered a long time ago, but we're going to do it again. It's Instagram engager audiences, and, and really for that matter, Facebook engager audiences for influencer accounts. But we all know, or maybe we don't, but one of the high, the highest level, <laughs> the highest level retargeting that you can get is ad engager or post engager audiences. So these are people that have liked, commented, or shared on your Facebook posts. In there, though, is also an option to do that from your Instagram feed. So people that like or comment on your Instagram account. Now, knowing that a lot of you guys are starting to use our Instagram growth tools, you should be getting a lot more traffic on Instagram. Now, one of the reasons that this is really valuable is because not only do we want those people to see us on Instagram and be able to DM them, but they're also now a part of an audience that we can use in Facebook for paid media to be targeted to. So when you go into the Facebook audience section, it's in the second, there's one tier above, and then below that is another set of audiences. One of them is Instagram business profile. And you can go in there and you can say anybody that has engaged with you up to the last 365 days. I've been using audiences of one day, 30, and 365. So one day means I've engaged with you in the last 24 hours, which means you're really top of mind and super fresh inside of that person's, um, on top of their mind. But in the last 30 days is getting everybody that's basically regularly engaging with you, which means these are high value, multi-touch folks. And, and it, this is a great audience for you to start to use some retargeting efforts for. You basically treat it as like a website audience, but these are people that have not yet been to your site because you're tiering them, ad engagers on top, and then you're excluding site traffic from that. And then you exclude product page visitors. And below that is add to cards, so yada, yada, yada. But this is somebody that you're not prospecting to because they already know who you are. They've already engaged with your content. Not only have they seen what you have to say, but they've taken the time and enough effort to like, comment, or share on it. So these people know who you are, and this is a warm lead. So now when you're showing them an ad, this is still you reaching out to folks that have not engaged with your brand at, through your website, but you're using your Instagram growth tool as a source to bring in an uh, audience for you to re-engage and essentially prospect into, but it's warm prospecting. This will almost always do better than any lookalike or interest group or broad targeting because they already know who you are. So our homework for this week is just make one of these audiences, screenshot it, send it to me, and you get a free ebook or half off the Slack, the Patreon, or one-on-one -on -one calls, right? Very simple, very easy. All you need to do is make the audience screenshot that show me inside of your custom audience and you get anything that you want that I've mentioned there. I told you, it'd be easy, and I think people really miss this opportunity. Also, when I'm making audiences and I'm executing on this, I'll combine Facebook and Instagram ad engagers inside of the same audience, because Instagram tends to be incremental on top of Facebook, but not always. The overlap tends to be pretty high, but it's a way of making your Facebook ad engager audience bigger and a way to reach people that you would not have otherwise seen. And it's a great way to tie in Instagram activity to Facebook ads, which makes your Facebook ad placement, when you're choosing auto placement, it'll choose Instagram more often because that user is already engaged with the on Instagram, which means you get higher spends and a larger share of voice inside of you retargeting both mid and bottom funnel audiences because Facebook already has signals from that Instagram account onto your Facebook page and to your business account. So not only does it give you a new audience to target, not only does it increase the value of the of those of those touch points, but it also gives you a larger share, of, <laughs> also gives you a larger share of voice and lets you spend more money inside of retargeting. 
to higher return on ad spend and not just in the ad engager your ad account your ad, don't give the talk off your ad to carts your view content your initiate checkouts your site traffic when you choose auto placement it will focus more spend in the instagram because it knows that that person has responded to you there and it has enough signals to say that you are a higher quality advertiser which at the end of the day actually makes all of your advertising more efficient because Facebook knows that these people are receptive to your content. So your quality score, uh, well, it's not really a quality score, but in the algebra of how they do their bidding, there's an uh, advertiser value that's mapped to your bid, that's mapped to the inventory and the CPMs from all their advertisers. If people respond more positively to your ads, then you are going to get CPMs lower, which means you're going to get CPCs lower, which means you're going to have lower CPAs, which means your ROAS is going to go up. So just adding this audience into your retargeting campaigns immediately reduces the CPMs of your entire ad account. Now, it's a matter of scale, obviously. If you're spending $20,000, $50,000 a day, it's going to happen really quick. If you're spending 100 bucks a day, you're going to see it, and it's a best practice, but it'll also help you scale more because you're getting more touch points across multiple platforms, which is the whole point of using auto placement. So yes, Instagram engage your audiences. Make them today. Send me a screenshot. You get 50% off the Slack, the Patreon, or one-on-ones, or I'll just send you a free ebook. So do that. A send free it to ebook. <laughs> right. And our ebooks for you guys that don't know, we've got stuff on CBO. We've got stuff on the brand builder, which is coming out this week. We've got two uh, sexy tips and tricks of a seven-figure monthly advertiser. That's me. Um, that's Charlie. That's right. We also have retargeting. We've got micro budget. We've got macro budget. We've got the funnel. We've got how to do prospecting. A lot of different things. And these ebooks aren't super wordy. They're not super detailed. They're not very hard to get into. They're usually 10 to 12 page, basically PowerPoint text. What you get in PDF form with graph, so you can see uh, visualizations of how to get things done with simple um, instructions. The idea is you can take it and you can execute on it immediately. And if you take that ebook and nothing and something in there doesn't make sense, we can do like Sanarib has done, or like Raba has done, or like Lance has done before, or a million other people, and say, hey, I've taken this ebook, I didn't quite understand this thing, tell me out, and then I can help you, and that helps thousands of other people inside of this group so anyway please do that i love you guys thank you very much now let's dig into uh bucket base cbo immediately following this coffee break with the cpo wait what cbo with the cpo oh yeah cpo chief puppy officer Come on. sorry i thought you were putting the hat on him he makes his it's weird. Uh, sorry, I, if you guys are asking questions or something, Facebook is not showing it to me up on the thing here. Maybe I can, um, let's see. Ooh, maybe I can, uh, I'm not giving away 25000 Sorry, Joe. Let's see. Can I see it here? No, quiet. Uh, all right. Uh, Facebook's not showing me the comments, so hopefully that will happen and we'll recover those things. Uh, now it's counting me as a viewer. That's fucking weird. Um, okay. So uh, if you, when you comment on it, I'm just going to keep on my phone and try to do it that way. Who knows what's going on? Anyway, so bucket-based CBO. This is something that I've been talking a lot about, and we're going to get back to it. We're actually launching a huge test running this against Facebook starting tomorrow. Um, extraordinarily high budgets, extraordinarily long uh, case study time to prove that our way is better than their way for best practices, and we're going to win. Anyway, that being said, let's get to it. So first off, what is CBO? CBO is campaign budget optimization. It means that you set your budget for a campaign at the campaign level instead of at the ad set level. What is the purpose of CBO? The purpose of CBO is built by the engineers, as it's been explained to me when I go to Menlo Park, is that Facebook gets a bunch of signals from people. If you let Facebook decide where to spend the money, you should be able to take advantage of the most opportunity. This is the Steelers house. You can take that Raiders hat. Get the hell out. <laughs> this is my trivia hat. Okay. Okay. You. <laughs> okay. So CBO is supposed to use. <laughs> C 
CBOs are supposed to use the signals and the data that Facebook has to assign between your variable audiences that you put inside of a campaign all of your ad sets and, and you spend the money where it sees the most opportunity. Now, where's the problem with that? If you listen to the verbiage, and it's something that I've, quite, I've guaranteed uh, I've measured with the measurement team and the engineering team, something I've confirmed, it's where you have the most opportunity. Most opportunity is defined as lowest CPMs and high, which directly relates to largest audiences. CBO, unbridled, will spend your money right away in the audiences that are the biggest. So if you've got an ad to cart one day and everybody on Facebook, Facebook will spend all of its money on the broad targeting and basically ignore the ad to cart. You, so that's what CBO, so that's the issue. So that's what bucket-based CBO solves for. In addition to that, bucket-based CBO also allows you to take advantage of iterative creative testing, which is a piece that we're gonna get into, sorry, somebody wants to join the group, which is a, a piece that we're gonna also get into probably next week um, about the creative iterative testing on how to do that most, uh, how to do that properly. Um, maybe we'll just do it today, fuck it, why not? So, yeah, we'll do it. Let, we'll just turn bucket basing the CBO, okay. So anyway, the last issue of CBO is that it will work. In theory, it will work, especially when you give it enough time. Now, Facebook has already changed their best practice from throw everything into CBO to test inside of CBO and then launch a new CBO campaign where you take your best creative and you launch them there. Now, that makes sense because you're letting one thing do the learning and something else be where you have all your best performing assets. The problem is that the engineers at Facebook that are building this aren't business owners. They're not marketers. They're not advertisers. They're not people that have to worry about the bottom line. They're saying, if you give us enough data, we will make the right choice. The problem is we don't have the time or the money in order to get enough data. Yes, you get billions of data points when you're sending out an ad, and Facebook has all of that inside of its ecosystem. But for them to be able to get enough data points to connect, to start being able to make decisions for you isn't just the learning phase of some ad set. It's at a learning phase of the entire campaign and they don't have a number for that. And I can tell you, as somebody that has spent a fuck ton of money, it takes thousands and thousands of dollars and weeks on end and hundreds of conversions for that optimization to even start. Which means that if you're trying to do prospecting on Facebook or do creative testing, your business will go out of business before Facebook understands what the hell it's supposed to do. Now, going out of business, clearly bad for business. So bucket-based CBO is a way that I've developed to uh, get around those issues. It's funny, I was talking with the Facebook reps in my office this week, uh, who just got engaged, by the way. Congratulations, thank you. Not that you're watching this, but whatever. Um, is that the CBO works unbridled. It can be like a child wandering out into the world and when it makes a mistake, it tries not to make it again, but it learns from the mistakes and it learns from the wins. But if you train it like a dog, it will learn a lot faster. So this is how bucket-based CBO works, is that it trains the algorithm to know what a win is and what a loss is much faster it forces spend to be diversified among variable creative concepts, and then you build campaigns around your winning ideas, which means that the campaign from the very beginning is being focused into winning based on your business objectives. It uses both losses and wins over creative testing process to define what a valued customer looks like, and when you do get a win, it allows you to measure that win to, re to recreate those wins, to keep them stable and to scale those wins, and then, to, and then to replicate that process over and over and over again, so that if you get one win, two wins, three wins, five, in order for you to scale your brand, all you need is creative wins, and the more good sales pitches you have, creatives, then the better, the more capable you are to scale. Most people's issue is they're trying to find the right audience for their ad. That's the wrong way of thinking. You need an ad that works for your target audience. So you need to create multiple pieces of creative and find which one works. That's, that's the main issue. The turn in Facebook over the last year and a half or so has been making it creative focused, 
not offer and sales funnel focus. The winning creative will always win. And the reason that happens is because of the thing we were talking about earlier with the Instagram engager audience is that the value score they put on an advertiser will always outweigh just about everything else besides bid when it comes to winning in the auction. And this is something we talked about about simplifying your ad account last week in one of the four steps that it takes to double the profitability while also increasing spend on that five figure a day brand is that when you show the right creative to the right people and make it easy for them and a positive experience for them, Facebook will reward you by giving you preferential treatment in the auction. So when you're giving yourself preferential treatment at the creative testing level, in order for you to scale your ad account, all you need is ads that people like. If you make Facebook's experience enjoyable for your customer, Facebook's ad performance will be enjoyable for you. Remember, you are providing content for an ecosystem that people use for pleasure. You have to make pleasurable experiences for them. And in reward for you making good content, you will be able to print money. It's You have to think about it that way. Does my ad burden or add value to my customer? Okay, so the basics of the way CBO works and creative iterative testing is the, is the basis of CBO. So first, and this is something we went over in the sexy tips and tricks from this week. The number one step is we're going to organize our creatives by concept, right? So what's our sales pitch, right? And we've talked about this a lot with, with the pop, right? Where maybe we've got Morrison dog food ads, okay? Not that he has a dog food, but it's a great example. And he's asleep. Not really. He's faking. So if we have dog food ads, we might have dog food ads where it's like dogs running in a field. We might have ones where they're like munching on, on grub. We might have ones where we just show product pictures. Those are all different concepts, different sales pitches. Now, the sales pitches might be the same creative but with different copy or might be different layouts or all sorts of things. It's really easy to take one video that's, say, a minute long, and run it against one copy. Let's use that example. So you have a one minute video and you've got your best performing copy. That's one asset. Now, how do you make a concept out of it? You can take that video and you're running it as a video ad with a CTA at the bottom as a conversion ad. Great. Now, if you take a still from that video or something, maybe B roll from the shoot or something along those lines, uh, but basically something that's in the same theme and you make a still image and you run that with the exact same copy, with the exact same CTA, everything, and you run that, now you have a, a, a video and a still image. Now, the last thing is, I make what's called an organic post, where you go into your page post section inside of Ads Manager, which is way up there, and it's in the, I think the first folder, and the first one, you hit the hamburger button, and then the thing comes out, and then below that is a bunch of options. Um, there's a thing called page post. And you can create a dark post. Now, this is Facebook advertising from like four years ago, but it's definitely valuable. And people basically have been ignoring it. When you go in there, you can create a post that's not visible on your page, but you can use it as a page. It's treated as a page post. Now, what you do in there is you can take either that video or that image, something that feels organic, something that you'd post to your Instagram account just on its own, and you can take the control copy that you have, plus all the stuff in your headline, in your description, and links to your page, and you do a very long form version of your copy. Because you're not gonna put a button at the bottom of this. You're not gonna put a headline or a description or the shop now or anything. You're just gonna put it as, you know, Morrison Dog Food, blah, 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 blah. Here's what people are saying. Uh, buy it now, click on this link. So you want the buy now link to be above the fold before it says see more. And then you can have all the text that you want. Yeah, he's happy about it. So you can have all the text that you want. And then this is long form copy. This is called an organic post. Now, why does this work? Putting them together is that you're showing somebody a video, a static image, or an organic post. Some people respond to videos. They love videos. It's really cheap CPM. Some people love to watch them. Some people just want to see the ad. They're very old school. They want to see the print ad from the newspaper. That's all they care about. Some people, as soon as they see that CTA button, that shop now feature, they're leaving immediately. 
But if you've got a long form of copy, something they can dig their teeth into, that's, that's just basically looks like a page post that's being sponsored inside of the feed from a brand that they trust, then they'll read the whole thing and then they'll click on the button. You're giving Facebook the option of showing the right creative to the right individual. All three of those things are, responded, are variations off of one creative asset, which now gets you a fully rounded out concept. A great concept is three to five pieces of creative. I would say just make three. Now, that's one piece, that's one creative concept. And this is something we went over earlier this week in the, in the you know, some of the weekly or the daily, um, the, the today's sexy tips and tricks is about the mixed media. If you take that and then you change the copy to make it from super salesy to maybe another sales pitch, um, where you're saying 50% off and then it's summer sale or the highest quality thing. If you change the copy, you now have one concept with, with copy A, another concept with copy B, another concept with copy C. Now you have three creative concepts. And then if you take maybe a different edit of the video or a different still, or you make a different organic post, you can take those three creative concepts and then by doing just a slight change, a slight change in the creative, you can make it six or nine creative concepts. So now from essentially one one minute video, you can have nine or 20, you know, the amount of iterative variations you can create on it is basically endless. I've done dozens and dozens and dozens of creatives essentially off of one 90 second video. Also, while you're doing this, try to make your videos under 60 seconds so that they can show on Instagram. However, if it's over 60 seconds and that's a version of one of your concepts, that's fine. Make sure there's a business reason for it, but have both. That's absolutely great. No problem with that at all. Now, say we've got those three creative concepts with the one asset with three different sets of copy. Now we have three concepts with three creatives underneath them. That's nine ads that we've made essentially in an afternoon. So how do we use bucket-based CBO to test those and to begin to scale them? We need to put them all into their own ad set. So each ad set essentially is testing each creative. So Copy A, B, and C are an ad set one, two, and three, right? So then what we need to do is we need to set up audiences for this. Now, the best audiences you're going to have are lookalike 1%. By the way, side note, if anybody ever says, oh, I've exhausted my audience or this lookalike doesn't work anymore, um, they're wrong. That is a patently false thing. The only way you're going to exhaust an audience is if you spend tens of thousands of dollars a day against that audience especially a lookalike, especially anything over 1%. What generally happens is when you launch an ad set, you, Facebook knows who the three to 10 people that are most likely, <laughs> most likely to win inside of that ad set. So you get lucky right away and then performance drops off because you've lost all the low hanging fruit. Those are people that you would have gotten in, an, in another ad set, but you've stolen performance from one pool and gotten it somewhere else and then it drops off immediately because you basically just rob Peter to pay Paul, that whole thing. Fucking Paul, right? Fucking Paul. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, I still haven't seen the comments. I feel really bad. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, when, when we're done on a roll here, I'm gonna go back on my phone and just start to see this one. But anyway, Barbara. so answer your questions right after this. Uh, we're not rickrolling anybody. And don't you do it. I swear to God, don't rickroll people. I'm never going to give up. Okay, I won't let you down. Um, so now we have those concepts, right? So we need to make audiences for each one, and we're going to use a 1% lookalike. We're not just going to use one 1% lookalike. We're going to stack multiple 1% lookalikes. And this is so we, you see in the Venn diagram of the circles, and then, you know, they overlay each other, and that middle section is the, is the really strong piece. So, right, they're the best. Uh, so what we're gonna do here is take a 1% lookalike from all purchasers from your store from the last six months. Also, you can make a, what's called a value-based lookalike, where you, when you go into creating a lookalike audience, it's using the information off of your pixel to find who the people are that spend the most. So you're finding a lookalike of everybody that's bought from you, and then you're finding the people that have spent the most on your store. In addition to that, we're going to make a 1% lookalike for the people that are buying the product that you're trying to sell. So, for instance, uh, he's out of frame right now, but Morrison, when it's Morrison's dog that's food, me. that's him. So, if we're trying to sell Morrison's dog food in a 10-pound bag, hey, buddy, 
That's his biggest move. <laughs> that is his biggest hit. So then we have a lookalike audience of everybody that's bought Morrison's dog food. Then we have a lookalike audience of the people that have spent the most money on Morrison's dog food, our highest value customers, value-based lookalikes. And we're going to make a lookalike audience of people that have bought the 10-pound bag. And then all of our concepts are trying to sell the 10-pound bag. So we're running – you make those three 1% lookalike audiences, which means you're getting the lowest hanging fruit of the three types of buyers that we want to find. Anyone that's purchased from us, the people that are most likely to spend the most amount of money, and the people that have bought the specific product that we're selling. You stack those three audiences, so when you make your ad set, and you're using which custom audiences to include, it's each of those 1% lookalikes, all three of them. What happens is these are all going to be fairly close. There's a lot of audience overlap between them, and that's fine. What we want is the audience overlap. Facebook will immediately, when you launch this ad set, We'll look for the people that are in all three audiences. Now, somebody that is, looks like the, some, the person that is bought from your store and looks like the person that spent the most money and looks like the person that will buy that product is a super, super high-value customer. You're not going to find that customer unless you stack those lookalikes. <sighs> Absolutely. She did the stacking thing. <laughs> So you stack those lookalikes on top of each other. That also gives you a bigger reach, which means your audience is in America. A 1% lookalike is about 2 million people. You stack those three lookalikes on top of each other, and depending on your store, you'll get an audience of between 3 and 5 million, which means if it works, you can spend $1,000 a day on it for the next five years, and you'll never exhaust that audience, which means that it's stable, which means it's scalable, which means that you're going to be able to project performance of that creative against that audience and you can build an entire campaign around it because you're not looking for more success. That alone will bring your entire store from $100 a day to $1,000 a day. You only need to win once. So in that, you're including those three lookalikes, and you want to exclude anyone that's purchased from you and you know, whatever your retargeting audience is for um, your retention efforts. But remember, we're moving retention into a warm audience inside of our retargeting. So if it's purchases in the last 30 days, great. The Any audiences that you're retargeting in your mid-funnel will be excluded from this. So that's pro probably site traffic from the last 50, you know, uh, 30 days or uh, ad engagers from the last 30 days or purchasers from the last 30 days. If you exclude those three audiences, that's great, which means that this prospecting is essentially people that have not engaged with your brand or been to your page or experienced you or bought from you in a month. That's a great audience to prospect to because almost any product that we're selling, within a month, if you like that product, you're going to buy it again. And if not, uh, then you need to show an ad to somebody because they've already gone through an email experience. They've already possibly gone through a chatbot experience. They've already gone, they've already experienced your product, and if they're eligible to buy again, they would have, which means you need to treat that person essentially as a cold prospect. Um, and hey, if you include warm folks into that cold prospect, the audience will only do better, but you're not stealing performance from your mid-funnel, so you're running with basically the highest quality audience you can that doesn't steal from your mid-funnel audience. So for this example, you've got your, you got your 1% of all buyers. You've got your 1% value-based lookalike, and you got your 1% of um, the people that have bought that product, which, by the way, if you need to make that audience, the easiest way of doing it is using the pixel helper, go into the product page for that product, and when you look at it, the pixel helper will be right up here, and then it pulls down, and then in there is uh, it'll show you view content, it'll show you the content ID for that product. And sometimes there'll be multiple content ideas because you have variants. That's fine. You want to make a custom audience of people that have purchased um, where the content ID contains, not equals, but contains those numbers for those products. It's a bit more in-depth. If you have questions about that, I can link you to the Facebook blueprint on how to do it. And they'll show you in massive depth for free, way better than I can explain it to you right now. <clears throat> so we've got those three lookalike audiences, and we're excluding purchasers 30 days, site traffic 30 days, and ad engager 30 days, right? So now this is some, these are your highest quality cross-section of customers, excluding anybody that you retargeted. 
that's your audience for your testing, which means it's always the same audience and you're always excluding the same people, which means all of the audience testing performance can be compared against each other and you're giving it the highest chance for success. So now we have our three concepts and we've got our testing audience. So you put those, the three creatives for each concept into its own ad set and then you're making three ad sets, one for each concept and you're using the same target audience for each one. Those three, those three 1% lookalikes excluding the mid funnel audiences. Now, what we're really starting to veer from Facebook best practice, but we're testing to prove to them that we're better than them is on the spend limits. And you've heard me talk about this a lot and I'm putting it in the group. So we're covering that part today, which is one of the sexy tips, uh, multiple of the tips that I dropped this week is spend limits. What we want to do is set minimum and maximum spend limits for our audience. Now, for the purpose of this conversation, I'm going to just use the number 100 as our daily spend. It could be 10 for you. It could be 1,000 for you. But 100 makes the math really easy to explain. So if we have three concepts that we want to test, and, and for the purpose of making this math simple, let's just say we have five. All right, so you've got five concepts. And we want to test, and we've got a budget of $100 that we're willing to spend against each concept per day, which means our testing budget should be roughly 10% of our overall budget. So anyway, what I want to do is say if we're looking to spend roughly $100, if it was an ad set budget level at $100, you want to find the middle ground there where we can average to it. If you have a $100 ad set budget, we want to set our spend limits to be around that range. Your spend limit should be about 80% of, 80 to 90% of what your, don't you, this is, no, I'm not a Raiders fan. Oh my God. Okay, I'll wear the Dodgers one. Oh shit, okay. So your spend limit should be about 80, 90% of what your ad set budget would be, your minimum. Your maximum will be 50% more than that. So if your ad set budget would be 100, you can set your minimum at 80 <laughs> and your maximum at 50% more than that, which is 120, right? So yeah. now the middle ground of that is the 100 that you would normally set. So if we have five concepts, the total minimum budget of 80, uh, if you combine all five of those, is $400, right? Because it's five times the 80 minimum ad set. We want to go for 20% more the total sum of all your minimums. And I know this is getting really kind of hectic, but if you have your ad set minimums, your campaign budget needs to be 20% more than the sum of all the minimums of the ad set for ad sets that are currently active. So if we have five currently active ad sets with a minimum budget of 80 each, that's 400, right? Uh, 80, 160, 240, 320, 400. Then your campaign budget needs to be 20% more than that, which is 480. What you're doing is you're telling Facebook, I want to spend a minimum of this amount of money into each ad set. Now, I'm giving you more money, which you can spend wherever you think is best. Now, remember what we said, too. Facebook will look for the most opportunity, which it defines essentially as the cheapest CPM. If all of the audiences are the same, where Facebook will spend the money is on the creative that performs the best because it's being rece received by the audience the strongest, which is giving them the highest quality user experience, which is giving you a better user score, which is giving you a lower CPM. So Facebook will cherry pick the ads in any one of those ad sets that it likes the most, and it will send that out and focus its money on that, which tells you where your best creative is because you're letting the creatives tell you how Facebook will receive them. Now, that might not necessarily be the best performing ad that gets the most spend, but it'll be the ad that Facebook users enjoy the most. <clears throat> now, hopefully those are the same thing. 90% of the time they are. But we've now got an, 
we're doing iterative creative testing across multiple ad sets. Each ad set is being measured against the same standard or yardstick, and we're letting Facebook take the extra money. So we're accounting for 400 out of 480. So Facebook can use the C it can use CBO to spend the other eighty dollars wherever it defines is the most opportunity. But because the audiences are all the same, the opportunity is all the same. The only difference is the CPM on each ad based on the quality of that ad to the end user inside of Facebook. I know that's a big thing, but let me try to recap that a different way. Each creative is going to be received by the end user in their newsfeed differently. People will like some more than they like others. The ones that people like will get a lower CPM. The ones that people don't like, you'll be penalized for it because it's a burden on their newsfeed. Uh, Facebook will then, inside of CBO, funnel those extra dollars, that extra 20%, the, the 80 on top of the 400, to the ads which people enjoy, which means you're going to be able to see which concept out of those that we launch in each ad set, which concept most closely matches what your target audience wants to see. So now you're using your creative testing to define what your customers want from you so that you can make better ads for them, which means you're creating higher quality content for Facebook, which means that your ad account gets a higher advertiser score, which means that you're going to win more auctions, which means you're going to be paying a lower CPM, so you'll get a lower CPC, so you'll get a lower CPA, and you'll get a higher ROAS. You're using your CBO creative testing to make your entire ad account more efficient and higher quality. That's the point of bucket-based CBO. At the creative testing level. Bam! Boom! Thank you. <laughs> that was the mic drop point, but I know it was a long thing. There you go. All right. So now what happens is when you find winners. There's a microphone. I, 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 yeah, there's a microphone in the phone. Yeah, now I got it. Thank you. When you find winners, and by winners, I, you, what you want is things that perform st at a stable level. You might have some days that are a 0.2 and some days that are 2x. That's fine. You want ads that are receiving above that ad set minimum every single day and that in on average give you purchases and desirable engagements or actions on a daily basis. So there might be one ad set that gets you know 3x the first day and doesn't really spend the rest of the days anything more than that 80 that you gave it. And it's really inconsistent. That is a much worse ad set than something that gives you a 0.8, a 1.1, a 1, a 1.5, a 0.6, but every single day it's serving and it's spending 100, 110, 120. It's hitting that ceiling all the time. Facebook wants to spend more there. When you're looking at the results of creative testing, that is how you find your winners. So if you have something that's a loser, turn the ad set off and remove the spend limits so that it doesn't count to your total. This will, without changing your campaign budget, scale your spend to your winning creatives. Because now, instead of that 480 whatever being split five ways, um, it's now only split four ways, and you're able to assign that 80 minimum to the other ad sets. So instead of 80 minimum, now there are 100, and your maximum is a buck 50 uh, because your minimum is a 100. Still the 480 total campaign budget, but now you're scaling your winners. So you're immediately tested, and you're immediately starting to scale which means that testing campaign will improve performance. Now, with the increased spend, some of those things that looked good might show that they were really just lucky and they might drop off. If that happens, turn them remove the spend limit, reallocate the spend to the winners. You might have some that continue to perform well after they've been pushed once or twice. When that happens, 
you move things to the next phase here. Then the next phase is uh, moving it. We, I, internally, we call it the minor leagues because now it's been testing. And we're you know using Dodgers baseball terminology here. What you're going to do Sports. is... Sports, yeah. <laughs> thanks. Uh, what we're going to do is you're going to duplicate that ad set inside of the same campaign, but you're going to change the audience. Instead of a 1% lookalike, make it a 2% lookalike, excluding the 1. So now you're going after an incrementally worse audience, but people still are on the same value. It'll be the same size audience because it's really 1%. It's really a 2% lookalike on top of the one, so it's just an additional 1% lookalike. But it's another three to five million people and slightly lower quality. But those people, a lot of them, you know, maybe the 2% lookalike of the value based audience was in the 1% lookalike of the purchaser audience. So it's just giving you a little bit of incrementality. It's not actually an additional three to five million people, but because you're excluding the 1% from it, it's going to really give you just this is the next tier of customer and then you can find the cross sections there and you're going to continue to be able to win so you launch against that two percent and then you launch against broad which is basically anybody in your target market now if you're say you're doing a men's you know combat boot or something right i don't know why i chose that but we'll just go for that for the example then you choose men you know 18 to 65 plus or say, you know, Morrison's dog food happens to appeal to, you know, uh, empty nester women. Those are who's buying it. So you're choosing women, 45 and plus. Because uh, you have to do 10-year increments and 55 plus. You might be missing 50-year-olds whose you know, kids have gone off to college. So anyway, when you define who your target audience is, your broad is going to be saying everybody. No interest groups, no lookalikes, no be none of that stuff. Everybody. Everybody. Now, the one proviso that I forgot to mention here that we're going to use for all of these audiences is you want to layer on the behavior engaged shoppers. Uh, I should have mentioned that before. I just was so on fire I completely forgot it. Uh, engaged shoppers is a behavior that you can layer in in your interest section. And what it is is a – Giant pool that Facebook has determined of people who are likely to buy from Facebook ads. So it's the find audience of people who are most likely to respond to buying on the platform. All right, well, we're, we're getting, we're losing our, our company here. So layer on engaged shoppers. This will shrink your audience down, but it'll make it a much higher quality audience. So, um, so now we're testing 1% lookalikes. We're stacking, we're testing all of our creative concepts against a stack 1% lookalike with engaged shoppers, excluding our retargeting pools. And we're doing that across multiple concepts. And the ones that win are getting <laughs> – hey, that's the pup. Okay. So the ones that win are getting higher budgets because you're reducing the spend – Share, you're reducing how much you're diversifying the share of spend across other concepts by turning the bad concepts off and giving it more money. Um, and then the ones that win, you are now, exp you, you are scaling it not only by increasing spend, but launching against a 2% look like in abroad. Wow. Okay. Nice. It's Pow Chow and the Dodgers fan. Here we go. Okay. There we go. All right, I'm going to put him back here so that it can be animated. There we go. All right, so, so now we, what we have is a creative, iter, a iterative creative testing process that is testing concepts against concepts against the same measurement. We're using spend limits, minimums and maximums, to train the CBO to find a good customer and using the wins and losses from concepts that have worked and didn't work to inform that campaign of who a good winner is because those failed concepts also show Facebook who not to target, which is just as valuable as a win. I would argue it's actually more valuable to know who not to spend on is really good information. So now you're collecting all of your testing data together and that's helping inform the ones that do win when you expand them by giving them a larger share of that budget and then increasing that budget by launching against a 2% lookalike and against broad. <clears throat> now, the last step for it 
is when you take this audience and it works against the 1%, the 2%, and the broad. At this point, you've defined a winning concept. You've defined a campaign that you can scale against. So you take all of your other testing, even if it's in the minors, even if it's a new idea, and you move that to a new campaign and you just start the process over. Take everything where it was. If something was in testing and it made it to the 2% of the broad, bring it over there, duplicate it just as it is, and throw in new concepts and whatnot. But the current campaign, you want to keep the way it's set up because it's winning. So you turn off all the other concepts, turn, remove the ad set budgets, and now inside of this winning campaign, you should have the three concepts, or the one concept of the three creatives across the 1%, the 2%, and the broad audience, and then you can begin to scale those up incrementally. Now, I find that you can scale aggressively by making what was your maximum your new minimum. So saying, say you at this point your ad set budget is 300 and your maximum is 450, you can make your new minimum 450, which means your new maximum would have to be 50% more than that, which is 675. That's very aggressive. I would say that you don't need to be that aggressive. What I have found is small daily pushes allows you to capitalize on the stability of the performance without moving things too much. So say you're at that what, 400 ad spend level, 450. Uh, let's say it's just 100. Say it's winning at 100. I generally find that pushing things at 50 bucks a day isn't that much of a, of a strain on the system. And we're not trying to push things to the extreme. Slow movements in many places actually will move a mountain way more than trying to take the whole damn thing down at once. Because the problem is, too, if you change your budget by too much and you break it, that whole campaign is basically shot. It is so hard to recover a campaign that you've broken by raising the ad set budgets too much too fast. And I say 50 bucks, but I mean, it's whatever it is for you. But generally, if it's one or two more conversions you're asking that ad set to deliver a day, then that's perfectly fine. So if you're selling something for $20, a $50 increase is reasonable because you're only asking that ad set to really deliver one more conversion that day. And if it does two, great. If it does three, fantastic. But you're not asking it to do too much. And because you're doing 50 across three of them, Really, that's 150. So that's a big move, right? Now, in addition to those three audiences, the reason we call it bucket base is because you're going to build a bucket of audiences that work for it. So now you can start to introduce, well, maybe I want to try an interest group. Or maybe I want to try a certain behavior, right? So maybe it's newlyweds or it's people interested in, I don't know, TRX fitness. I don't claim the mind. Or maybe it's people, you know, that have children or something. So you can start to add in those other audiences, things that you normally ran on a campaign and said, well, this worked and then it died. You're using, you can duplicate that ad set inside of the campaign and layer on different targeting. Always keep engaged shoppers on. Keeping that off is just gonna hurt you. Um, but if you do that, you're building an entire audience around successful creative. Also, the ad learnings ha the learnings inside of a campaign happen at the ad level, which means that ad is starting at the 1% lookalike and one scaled up incrementally over time and then eventually went to another audience where it won and it learned more and then to a third audience where it won and it learned more. So now you've got hundreds or thousands of dollars against that creative. So that one ad knows who that target customer is. So at this point, you've trained CBO campaign to understand who the target customer is. You've trained the ad set to understand how to best perform. And you've trained that ad and to see who's responsive. Because remember, you have three ads inside of that concept that are all kind of targeting a different person. Because somebody might like video, somebody might like the organic, somebody might like the still. So you've now trained all of those ad sets with 
conversions. They've had good days. They've had bad days. They know who to target, who not to target. That entire campaign is also seen as a general function of your entire effort, who is good and who is bad. So now you've got really well-trained veteran ads. When you launch that into new interest groups, it's going out there with a whole history. It's been running for a while. It knows who's good and who's bad. It's not starting from zero. It's not trying to get lucky. It knows how to win. And you started it the same way we started the other things. With that interest group, excluding your retargeting audiences. And just that, you don't need to exclude the lookalikes from it. That's fine. You can have audience overlap because your budgets aren't large enough for them to compete against each other. Facebook will know inside of the CBO campaign, which is the beauty of the CBO, inside of this ad set, you know, you look like 1%, well, this person's here, but if I target that person, that individual might also be in the interest group, but maybe the interest group is a lower CPM that day because there's less advertisers targeting it. The same individual, it's cheaper to reach them over here than it is over here, so I'll reach them over here, and I'll get that sale. So now you're using the CBO training of where to diversify your money, allowing Facebook's ad tech to do its job that you've trained it to do, and finding little nuggets all over these different audiences. Now, the reason I call it bucket-based CBO, bucket is an old advertising term to define who your target audience is for a campaign. You're actually defining who your target audience is for this campaign, which is why it's a, a great name for it, if I do say so myself. Um, so now you've got interest groups, you've got behaviors, you've got lookalikes and broad targeting. Any one of those only really needs to spend, if, if you've got five or six audiences, they're all spending, they all have to spend $100 a day, and if they can't, or 50 bucks, whatever the number is, but they're spending a minimum every day, and they have to do that in order to succeed, and if success means that you're getting desirable results most days that's trending week over week that that audience does well, and if it doesn't, don't bring that ad set down to like $10 or $20. If you're not spending enough every day to get a conversion every day, then that ad set isn't strong enough. And if that ad set isn't strong enough, turn it off because what it's doing is it's stealing spend from one of the other ones. Remember, because we said Facebook is going to find that user in other places. And the reason we launched with Broad is Broad includes everybody. And it's the cheapest way of reaching everyone. So the interest group is just a narrowed version of the broad. If that interest group can't spend enough every day to stand on its own by delivering conversions on a daily basis, then kill it because all it's doing is it's hurting the broad. And the broad targeting is one of the three pillars that you built this entire campaign on. So ultimately, what we've done is we've taken one video asset that was a minute long made multiple versions of concepts around it across multiple pieces of mixed media. So we're showing it as stills and videos and organic posts. We've done a couple edits and we've done copy testing. And we've launched that against a stack version of 1% lookalikes so that Facebook can define who our best customer is. We've tested out the concepts that aren't stable because stability is the number one most important thing. And then we found which ones are stable. Which ones work against that 1%? And then we expanded it to 2% in the broad. We found out which ones can handle you asking it to work harder. Now, some of them will work at the 1%, but never work past that. And that's sad, but they're just not good enough to stand on. And if you want extra credit, you can take all your best performing ads from the 1% that failed when you expanded them and launch those as its own creative concept, and you'll tend to find winners there. But anyway, so we've taken that concept. We've tested it. We've now scaled against stuff that has worked. We're stacking learnings on top of each other in a way that's really stable. We're scaling the spend by turning off things that don't work to shift money to the things that do. Without actually increasing budgets, we've scaled our spend to our winners, which is increasing our ad performance, which increases our ad score inside of the marketplace so our entire ad account is more efficient. We've then narrowed down to single a single concept that works really, really well that we're able to scale spend against. And then we moved our testing over to another campaign, which immediately scales spend because now we've got one ad, set, we've got one co concept that maybe you, if you started at a hundred bucks, maybe it's not four or five hundred that's all spending on that one, and then you launch a new one 
that you can afford because this one's, you know, you scaled from that number to maybe 500, 800, 1,000. And this one is now 10% of your media budget is on new testing. So you've got a prospecting creative that you've tested out all the way. So you basically have taken one one minute asset, uh, asset uh, video, for instance, and you've created an entire ecosystem of testing that has trained Facebook to know who your target customer is, and has also trained Facebook to know, to tell you what people want to see from you. So it's increased your ad score, which has improved, which has improved your efficiency across the entire funnel. And you've done that to find creatives that you can scale against and you've determined what the ceilings of those, because every creative inside of every ad set is going to have basically a spend level that it maxes out on. And that is purely a reflection of your advertiser score, how good you are at making sure you're right, matching the right creative to the right customer, and how good that creative is at selling that product, how good of a salesman that ad is. And then the size of your audiences, because you're using interest groups and lookalikes and broad targeting, you know that you're getting yourself the maximum amount of opportunity. So what this has done is essentially created a repeatable, most importantly, it's repeatable, uh, way of testing creatives across multiple concepts against the same measurement uh, objectives against the same audiences in a very stable way that is scalable and projectable where you can compare results from six months ago to today across everything that also gives you opportunity so when you don't when you don't have more creatives you can cherry pick the best of the losers and launch those as new creatives which has also trained your ad account to perform more efficiently by training Facebook CBO campaigns to know who your target customers are, which means that you now have the best performing creative at a prospecting level, which you now can use those ads in your retargeting. A lot of people say, well, I want to use a different ad inside of ad to carts and a different ad inside of site traffic. Don't. That is overcomplicating the system. If you take the same ad for the same offer that works inside of Prospect and that has been a proven winner, Facebook has told you against the cold audience, this is the best sales pitch. You add that into your site traffic and you add that into your card abandoners and all of that. You know that that is the best sales pitch with the best salesman that you have. Run that everywhere. Now what happens is you're scaling the learnings on that ad set to much higher qualified audiences. And when you're showing that really great ad to somebody in a cart abandoned, that person's that conversion rate's gonna go way up because it's a cart abandoned, right? So that's a really high quality audience. Now, if it's the same ad that you're showing them in that really high quality audience, what happens to the prospect again? Is that it gets way more efficient because it's a much higher quality ad because you're showing it to people that are really likely to buy. So instead of it being to cold traffic, you're now letting your entire account advertiser score be rated on not just how you work to cold prospecting, but how that same ad works at the very bottom of the funnel. So you're capitalizing on your wins in prospecting all the way down your sales funnel to the very bottom. Now, a lot of people will say, well, you need a different sales pitch to the people, otherwise they'll never buy. And the honest truth is maybe you do. So maybe you have different create, maybe you have different campaigns at the bottom of the funnel to show different offers. But if you've got your $20 product that you're trying to sell, there's no difference between the sales pitch at the top versus the very bottom. And when you use your best performing creative at the top in the bottom, it makes the top perform better. And I've seen this have a 20 to 30% incremental lift. As soon as you expose the highest quality customers, to the same exact ad as your cold customers. It shows Facebook, because people respond to that, like, oh, that's what I wanted. They comment, they like, they share, they click on the ad, they buy. Facebook shows this is an ad people want to see, and it raises the efficiency by lowering the CPMs, lowering the CPCs, lowering the CPA, and increasing the match rate for the ad in prospecting, because now you're getting even more data. It's saying, 
the prospect is basically more or less saying who not to target, and you're eventually finding out who your target customer is. At the very bottom of the funnel, you're showing your best ad to the people that are hardcore best possible customers. So now it's being received at a much higher rate. People are converting much better, much lower CPMs, much higher engagement rate, much, you know, everything that Facebook looks at to see the quality of that ad is much better. And remember, the, the learnings happen at the ad level. So because it's the same ad, the efficiencies you're running at Add to Cart make the lookalike perform much better. So essentially, bucket-based CBO and creative testing is a way to find ads that make your entire ad account more efficient, smarter, and easier to be to scale by making the performance more stable and finding your customers easier. And you're using creative testing to make your entire account more efficient, which is why bucket-based CBO is better than what Facebook says. Now, I said I was going to cover all the sexy tips and tricks of the week, but they really was all just around this one concept, so I'm glad that I launched into that. Um, but that's basically it. Now, we've got an ebook on bucket-based CBO, um, which is uh, available on the Patreon. Go check it out. Um, if you do the homework for this week, I'll send you that ebook for free. And I also want to stress that I spent a whole month of June telling you that you don't need to spend money on Facebook prospecting to start your brand. And the honest truth is you don't. Bucket-based CBO, as we've defined it here, is a prospecting effort. If you're an advertiser that's spending less than 1000 a day and you're following that brand builder, then you're not doing any Facebook prospecting because it's a waste of money for you. You can do the same testing, but in retargeting. Instead of lookalikes, make it your site traffic from the last 30 days. Make it the highest level retargeting audience that you have. So it's ad engagers from the last 30 days. You want the creative testing to happen to the lowest quality audience that you have so that it has to do the hardest work. And the things that win there will improve performance everywhere. Also, if you do creative testing really low down in the funnel, like if I start creative testing card abandoner ads, the net effect is every dollar spent on a bad ad hurts my bottom line. You don't want a creative test at that level because that's your bread and butter. That's your strongest performing ad set. You don't, you don't test where you're winning all the time. You don't need to fix it because it's not broken. Test against your biggest audience. So if you're using the six-point the, the six strategy for e-com brand builder stuff, run this against your broadest retargeting audience. All the same rules apply. It's, but instead of a lookalike, it's your... Instead of the stack three lookalikes, it's the site, it's the ad engager because an ad engager is above a site traffic because you because the ad engager if people haven't been to your site yet, people have been to your site but not to a product page, and people that have been to your product page but haven't added to cart. That's your you know your basically your sales funnel, right? So the ad engager is at the top, and these are people that have already engaged with your content, so you know that they're going to be receptive. So that is now your newest. Um, testing audience and it's also the audience that has the most people in it you want your testing audience to be the largest audience that you have now ad engager for most people is the largest audience um, however uh, if you have a lot of traffic that's not on Facebook if you most of your traffic comes from influencers maybe or from other efforts maybe you're doing Google first and Facebook just as cleanup then your site traffic might be a bigger audience than your ad engager, in which case you kind of flip it. These aren't golden rules. The golden rule is that the highest level audience is the one that's the largest. So in this case, maybe it's your site traffic that's 30 days, but it's easy. Make the custom audiences, look at the size, whichever one's bigger is, your, is the highest level audience. So anyway, and you do the exact same fucking thing where you test the creatives by running that ad against those audiences and you find your winners. Exact same concept, just a different application. So, this has been a lot. I, I think I ran out of coffee 45 minutes. Uh, but I'm still not seeing any chat here and I'm really sorry. So sorry I haven't been able to get back to you guys on any of your questions.
but I'm going to go into the thing right now and we're going to find it out. Let's see, reacted to the live video. Okay, wait a minute, here we go. Uh, yeah, okay, so I got some of your questions now. Joe asks, so don't use CBO for cold prospecting. My CBO works great using lookalikes, but sucks ass for cold traffic campaigns. Um, I think we kind of answered that a little bit later, but Joe, um, I would say, yeah, run your CBOs only against lookalikes and only move past lookalikes once your uh, success is defined inside of that really high quality audience because you're letting the lookalikes audience train the ad to know who the best person is and you're letting, because all that testing has happened inside the same campaign, you're letting the CBO learn who the right customer is across all of your ad sets. <clears throat> so, and hopefully when you say cold traffic campaigns, I'm kind of reading that as you're not running a conversion campaign. All of this should be conversion objective. No campaign should be run outside of the conversion objective uh, if you're running a store for DR. Uh, Jack asked, hey man, what's your experience in manual bid on CBO? Uh, I find that manual bid works well. Auto bid works better for creative testing. Um, I find that manual bid works great for CBO, more for mid and especially for bottom funnel audiences. Um, you don't want to use it for creative testing because you're kind of withholding the ability for Facebook to make mistakes. If Facebook can't make mistakes, then it's not getting stronger. You're just kind of whittling down the things that you know. Uh, but in mid and bottom funnel, it's perfectly fine. If you know that you're doing, say you, and we went over this before, you've got a good, better, best uh, retargeting structure for your offers, then you know that success for you on a, say the $20 product is you need to make that sale for $10 or less. So you set your bid accordingly. For your $50, maybe it needs to be $25 or less. Let's say we're going for 2X. Good being 20, better being 50, best being a $100 product. Uh, and you need to get 2X, you can set your manual bids for 50% to target CPA, uh, or to, uh, the AOV on that offer. Um, now hopefully you're using uh, post-transactional upsells to increase the AOV, so really a $20 product actually comes in at like 30, 34, but whatever. Uh, if your goal is 2X ROAS, make your bid essentially half your average order value, your AOV on that ad, that offer. Um, and I would argue you make it a little bit more than that so it can make a mistake, right? Maybe you make it, instead of uh, you know half of it, maybe it's, if you're selling a $100 product and you need 2X, don't make it with 50, maybe make it like 60, 65, so there's a little bit of wiggle room because otherwise what happens is you're gonna limit your, you're gonna limit your delivery. But because you have all three offers, uh, you know that you're basically some days the $20 offer is going to do really well and the 100 is going to fail. Or some days the 50 is going to be the only thing that wins. Generally, between the three of them, you should be able to get a blended ROAS on a one-day post-click because that's the only metric that fucking matters. You're going to be able to get to that 2x, generally speaking, on most days. You're gonna to try to get. You're gonna be able to get there, and if not, then you know that you can increase or decrease your campaign budgets for each of those offers. Because if you know well, the the better the fifty dollar offer generally performs better than the other two, then it should have a larger share of your spend. So say it's hundred bucks each, and then that 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 mid level one is the best performing one. Well, maybe. It, it gets 150 and you pull 25 from the other two. Um, and that's just basic optimizations that'll happen after a campaign matures. Um, so hopefully that helps. Uh, also for manual bids, this is something that's going on in the Slack right now. Actually, Robin and I have been chatting a lot about it. Um, it's about target cost versus cost cap versus bid cap. And that's basically a good, better, best version. Manu uh, and we can get into that a lot too. But um, basically, bid cap is going to not let you bid more than that. 
which means you're going to have very limited delivery, but on the days where it can find the user, it's going to spend as much as it can. Target cost is a tool used for ad agencies to basically project out what the next three months is going to look like, and it's going to give you the most delivery, but it's rarely ever going to bring you in that target cost. So where manual bid is going to make sure that it's basically just a ceiling, you'll never spend more than that. Target cost is going to be the most amount of delivery with some control, and cost cap is basically in the middle somewhere. So really kind of play with those. I find target cost basically doesn't help because auto bid will auto bid in the CBO architecture will perform better than the target cost will. And the manual bid is great if you're using that to control spend share across multiple uh, offers. If all of that's really complex for you, try cost cap and put it maybe 10 or 20% over what your goal is just so that it continues to spend as much as it can. And then adjust your media spend amongst your multiple offers where you're spending the most of money and the one that you most often gets you the most return. Hopefully that helps. Uh, and again, I'm really sorry I couldn't see this stuff because you guys asked these questions a while ago. Uh, and Joe says, and never, uh, or it's a, uh, a name I can't pronounce because it's in letters that are not English. So I don't know them. But somebody asked me, what's my average CPP? Uh, what's my average cost per purchase? Also known as CPA, cost per acquisition, or CPO, cost per opportunity. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, I, I, have, I have campaigns that run $10, and I've got campaigns that run $150. Um, it's all over the place because uh, it's for multiple advertisers, multiple accounts, multiple clients, uh, multiple brands, multiple products. There is no sweet spot. Uh, this actually, this strategy works whether you're selling a $5 item or a $500 item, whether you're using it to sell a product or to get lead gen. Uh, it works with everything, which is why we're testing it uh, with Facebook. On a very high dollar, it's like a six-figure test over like a month, and they're paying half the bill, which is awesome. Uh, and Joe says, never stacked lookalikes. Uh, very good, got to try. You definitely shouldn't try that. That is the best practice is defined by me. Uh, and who am I? I am a member of the Facebook Disruptor Group, which means I'm one of the top 130 advertisers at Facebook uh, because I test the most amount of things. I use the most amount of data and challenge my reps. Um, on top of that, I am one of the leading uh, people inside of that group. I'm going to toot my own horn here, too, too, but I haven't met somebody inside of that group that is challenging things at the same level with the same aggressiveness and passion that I am. And I know that I'm in a place where I can, I can take more risks than most people, which means I'm going to get more wins than most people. And the honest truth is we've got a fair amount of disruptors in this group. And... Um, we're all pushing the boundaries, right? And that's why we're in the disruptor group because we're fucking disruptors for Facebook advertising. We define the best practice that are then taught to the reps, which then go out to other advertisers, including, you know, the gurus, which then they teach to you guys for hundreds of dollars a month, which is fucking ridiculous because basically the stuff that we talk about in this group is something that they're going to sell for hundreds of dollars a month six months from now, nine months from now. Um, they're scams. Uh, I mean, they're valuable. They absolutely help people out. But those people that know, that want to learn that, can get it for free here. Um, which really drives, I, part of my ego loves the fact that people are teaching stuff that I developed six months ago. Or that the Disruptor Group has challenged six months ago. And this is an internal Facebook sanctioned group, super high level reps. Basically, um, when I'm talking about testing, I'm not saying, well, this is something I'm doing on my ad account. It's, I've got somebody from the engineering team. I've got somebody from the measurement team. I've got some, I've got multiple reps and I've got basically internal high level Facebook employees across all sorts of departments giving me money and giving me exposure to do testing inside of the algorithm of Facebook to define best practices. And what we discover, what we define 
as a disruptor group becomes the best practice. Um, and like I said, uh, there are a lot of people doing a lot of things. I just, from what I'm exposed to, most of the time that I go to disruptor group meetings, it's remedial. Um, and that's great. Cause that means I'm doing something right. And you know, if I went to that meeting and my mind gets blown, uh, then fantastic. I want my mind to be blown. I want somebody to come across and do this better than me. I want somebody to do these things. But until then, uh, I'll take my spot as, you know, this guy, um, which is great. So anyway, that's it for this week. That's the live. I love you guys. Uh, join the Patreon. Join the Slack. Uh, take on some one-on-ones. Do your homework so you can, get, you can save money on those. Um, if you really enjoy this thing, please invite one friend. Uh, I, I don't remember the last time that we've done this much of a deep dive into something, but I hope that it's extremely valuable for you. If you're watching this in review, ask questions in the comments section, and I will respond back to them. Uh, if you're watching this in six months, if it's fucking like 2020 and you're seeing this, ask a question. I'll respond to it. All of this group uh, is to help each other. Every member of this group is to help each other. And all I'm asking for this for you guys in this group is to use the stuff and to challenge me. Um, I love this group because it because I'm at such a high level, I forget and I'm not exposed to problem solving and the needs of people at the very entry level. Or even mid level or ad agency level. I'm 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 at the fucking mountaintop, which means I can't see what's happening below me. This group helps me understand what's happening to everybody everywhere it exposes me to really good ideas that some random kid in indiana or india is coming up with that's better than anything that i've done and i've taken a lot of the lessons from you guys and challenged facebook with it and we move forward for instance the uh engaged shoppers thing was something that came from a facebook group this group uh, this group a group member that was testing it and that was like nine months ago, but implementing that. And then we had a whole thing about how to test that and how to expand all your audiences and double your spend and all sorts of things. Uh, there, there's plenty of ideas. Um, a lot of the lessons we have are things that I've come up with, but a lot of it is stuff that you guys have done. And if you've got wins, if you've got tricks, if you've got tips and tactics, drop them in the group and help everybody win. And if you've got something that's working for you and you're saying, hey, why isn't everybody else fucking doing this? Show me. And I'll try it. And if it works, show everybody. And I'll make sure that you, people know that it was fucking you that came up with it. And, and, and it was great. And I really appreciate it. For instance, we run everything. I've been preaching the, the scrum. And honestly, that was made by a guy named Arvin who runs over at another disruptor group and an ad agency that we both worked at years ago. Uh, I don't want to drop where he's working at, but he's in the disruptor group. You guys have seen his work. I guarantee it. There's creative best practices, which has come from Alyssa, which, by the way, happy birthday, Alyssa. I think it was this week. Uh, but it, uh, she works at, she's another um, member of the disruptor group. Uh, and uh, she's in this group, and, she, and, and her brand that she works with did some amazing things on creating thousands of pieces of content over uh, one or two video shoots. And I gave some of the advice that I was taught from her here. So, I mean, the beauty of this group is that we come in here with no ego, that we're trying to help everybody. And the more help we can give each other, the better we're all gonna be. So, I love you guys. I'm never going to sell you something. There's no fucking courses here. There's a Patreon in case you want to help. And I really appreciate everybody in there. We've got dozens of folks in there. I'd love to see dozens more. Um, there's a Slack group where people can talk to each other. And the reason it's there is so that people can share the private information with each other in a place where they feel safe and provide some value. And I, and I love it. And the eBooks are here for everybody. If you want any of this stuff, just do the simple homework from any of the live feeds and you'll get it for free. I don't know how else to make it happen. I just want to encourage you guys to win. Thank you very much. If you enjoy this, invite one friend. Other than that, I'm signing off. Goodbye, everybody. This has been special.
I really appreciate it. Tell me what you think. See you next week. Bye.